Hello, today I'm talking with Dr. Jen Unwin, and today we're talking about food addiction. Jen is the co-founder of Food Addiction Solutions, and it's a project to spearhead activities that can lead to the recognition of food addiction as a disease and for appropriate treatment to be put in place. And the vision is a society where the addictive nature of certain foods is recognized and focused treatment programs are being funded to improve health outcomes for sufferers. Thank you so much, Jen, for being in this place. There is not a single researcher on in food addiction in New Zealand. So we really need to hear from you today. Why is it important to recognize food addiction as a disease? Right, so um i would say so it's very it's actually you know reasonably common if you take the um very conservative prevalence very conservative of 10 percent you know that that's you know over five million adults in the uk so it's a you know it's a very common program and it's problem and it's associated with a lot of chronic health conditions so type 2 diabetes um if you've got food addiction i think you're seven times more likely to have type 2 diabetes um obesity uh mental health problems high sugar high ultra processed food diets are, are, are really linked with high levels of depression and, and, and anxiety uh and we know that these conditions are you know sort of getting to epidemic proportions in in our society so um, so that that's one reason it's a sort of almost like a kind of the elephant in the room really and you know we're always saying oh we need to do something about this diabetes and all this obesity but if we're not recognizing the fact that certain foods uh, are addictive in nature I don't think we're going to ever ever succeed at that so so that's one reason um, the other reason is that obviously un unless a condition is is recognized it's really hard to get money for research grants um you know it has it has to be something if people are applying for research monies it has to be a recognized condition and also there aren't going to be treatment treatments developed and evaluated so at the moment somebody with a food addiction really falls well kind of i don't nowhere really in terms of treatments that can be offered because they may get referred <laughs> to an eating disorder service but eating disorder services on the whole don't don't recognize this condition and and wouldn't know what to do with it and in fact a traditional eating disorders model is an all foods fit model that that recovery looks like people can sort of eat a bit of everything yes. and they moderate that no banned foods well every single food addict is going to fail with that model and that may explain some of the kind of poor outcomes that that we see in eating disorder services um so the, the eating disorder services is, is not going to help you you might get referred to psychiatry but they they're not going to understand it either or know what to do with you you might get referred to an addiction service but again they tend to work with substance addiction like you know drugs and alcohol so they're not quite going to know what to do with you or if they if they did a little bit of lateral thinking they would know what to do with you because obviously it's the same the treat you know the addiction treatment should be the same it's just that you avoid the the addictive part of the, the addictive substance if you like uh, and we all know that that would make sense we know that if you've got an alcohol problem then the effective treatment is to be abstinent and then try and maintain abstinence that's that's the treatment so it's basically the same with with food so so there's a lot of people in the uk and all over the world who are suffering with this problem they they don't have a name for it you know they feel ashamed of their behavior and they're and they're harming their health and none of that is their fault i think that's the important thing to say is that it's nobody's fault that they have an addiction problem um and they definitely don't need to feel ashamed about it and there are effective treatments it's just that because this condition is hidden because nobody's got a, a name for it then uh then people are left left without help and of course food addiction doesn't mean you have to stop eating all food it just means that there's certain kinds or types of food that you can't eat 
Yeah. So this is often a criticism of when we say food addiction, people say, well, how can food be addictive? You know, we need to live. It's not like you need alcohol or drugs or cigarettes. You know, you can give those up and they're not necessary for life kind of thing. Well, yes, of course, of course, that's true. We do need to eat to live, but we don't need to eat our drug foods. So they tend to be ultra processed foods that are high in sugars, refined grains, fats and salts or um things like things that are just high so yes i mean we all know we all know the kinds of things that are a little bit addictive sweets and 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 chocolate um but also um yeah these refined grain type products like pizzas donuts when when you do research and you ask people what are the kinds of foods they can't control their intake of or what what kind of foods do people tend to binge on it's it's all it's all those kinds of foods and none of us need to eat. we think we think we need those foods but actually we do, we don't need those foods and we look at a sort of ancestral um if we look at it through an ancestral lens we didn't evolve to eat those foods and that's part of the problem the foods are so stimulating to the reward center that we literally can't control our behavior and i think that's why i say it's not it's not it's not your fault you've just you're just it's just biology really yeah. and you're, you're responding to that stimulus to reach for more which is happening at a sort of non-verbal part of the brain so we, it's this automatic reaching and the people often i i mean i experienced that and and people often report that this sort of like yeah it's almost like your disembodied hand is reaching into the biscuit barrel uh, even at the same time as you're saying, well, I don't want to be doing this, and you're watching your, you're watching yourself do it. So, uh, yeah. And the the ultra processed foods come under what's called the Nova N O V A classification. So people can search that up and and see. And of course, some ultra processed foods might just be a sauce that it, you know a chili sauce that you hardly use, and that's okay. But what we're finding is that somewhere between forty and sixty percent of at least the Anglo nations, uh, the, the people, the calories in people's diets are these ultra processed foods. So again, it's, it's, as you said, it's not what we ever evolved to be able to consume and our, our brains just can't handle it. Mm. And I think once that's established, so unfortunately, of course, the younger generation are even more exposed to these foods than we were. And I think once that that once the brain has kind of been wired and the the reward centers sort of had that overstimulation from the ultra processed foods then then it becomes really hard for people to control their their eating behavior absolutely and food addiction was first described in 1956 so it's been around for a while just not mm. researched yeah yeah and they're probably i mean there probably were people before that i mean you, there was sugar around before that and there was bread around before that and those are you know some of the substances that um you know that that people come and they say you know it isn't it isn't necessarily sugar it's it's quite a common thing this bread people being and and they say you know i know it sounds ridiculous but i just can't stop eating bread we get that quite a lot and and interestingly i i'm aware that in the maybe the 70s or the 50s they they changed the rules around how long bread could ferment overnight and of course we see we saw a ton of changes in refining and the the management of of wheat flour and and wheat crops and so i think even though perhaps in the 70s our sugar consumption levels might have been similar we weren't maybe consuming as much ultra processed foods in addition to sugar and maybe we had more active lives in general yeah yeah i mean they've they've literally changed the the genetic um composition of the of the wheat which has made it much higher in gluten for example and we just we just don't know the effects of these these changes long term um even when it looks like a whole food you know it may it may not be the kind of whole foods that we used to eat Absolutely, absolutely. And so you recently, in 2022, you led um, a group uh, looking at a paper which um, called Low Carbohydrate and Psychoeducational Program Show Promise for the Treatment of Ultra Processed Foods. That was across three countries. Can you talk a bit about that, please? Yes, we love we loved doing this. So this came out of the idea that 
I mean, if you look in the literature, there's hardly anything on treatment and intervention. I mean, there's really nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so we, there's nothing. So we thought, right, okay. Um, I so I worked very closely with a nutritionist called Heidi Yeva here in the UK that I met when I was training with Bitten Johnson uh, t- to be a sugar addiction, uh, you know, kind, kind of food sugar addiction specialist. And um, so we've been collaborating. Um, over the last few years and we wanted to run a a program for people with food addiction and just like I did with David over the people with type 2 diabetes we thought well we need to you know we need to do this as a proper audit and you know have a look at um, the outcomes you know across the board and uh, see if it is actually effective and importantly (coughs) is it effective in the long term because where there is any research, you know, there's the odd paper looking at um, some small interventions. Does it, do, you know, do you get any improvement in food addiction symptoms? They tend to be like pre and post, you know, or maybe maybe a few weeks if you're lucky for the follow up. But we, again, we know this is a chronic condition. We know it's relapsing. So any treatment has to show that it it's it's effective long term. And we wanted to we thought you know from from looking at everything in the round then a low a low a a real whole food lower carbohydrate plan because it's abstinent from the kinds of foods that tend to uh, cause the cravings but also the other components not just giving people that information it's giving people the information about it being an addiction and how that affects the brain and you know what 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 you can do about that and what other things what other sort of um how would we say so if you're taking away somebody's Sorry, my dog excuse me i'm gonna oh, i'm so... gonna keep running but she's not allowed in the <laughs> in the in the thing um if if we if we're asking people to give up their their drug really their drug foods yeah. in the way that maybe they've you know got used to managing their emotional state and their brain neurotransmitter balance then we need they need to develop other things that are going to replace that um other ways of getting the dopamine and the serotonin so we talk a lot about that and obviously then it's it goes into support phase uh, so we were doing that, but we were also aware of um, some colleagues in North America who are collectively called Sweet Sobriety, um, Molly Hainshab and Clarissa Kennedy, and they've also been working with us on the on the consensus, um, and some other colleagues in Sweden, and they were also running similar programs that were based on this sort of re- real whole foods, low carbohydrate plus this psychoeducation about the addictive brain and what you do about that. So we thought, well, if we're going to do this, let's see if these guys want to do it as well. <clears throat> and they were they were really up for it because they knew that, that, A, that there wasn't any data. And also it's really nice to audit your own practice and just be able to show with data, you know, your clients that, um, you know, it's having some, some impact. So we did online groups. Um, between 10 and 14 weeks depending on which which country it was um and then you know and monthly follow-up and we we gathered we gathered all the data about food addiction symptoms mental well-being and we did look at weight weight wasn't our primary outcome really the primary outcome is around the addictive um thoughts and, and behaviors um and mental well-being we were really hoping to see improvements in those in those two things um and then usually weight comes along for the ride if you like if you start eating this real (laughs) this real whole foods way of eating um then you know you're likely to get some weight loss but we didn't we didn't sort of uh emphasize that even though it's often what patients are looking for we you know we try and work on them uh, and how long were the sessions for Ours were 90 minutes. So we did we did 10 lots of 90 minutes with this sort of set curriculum. And over 90% were female and the mean age was 50. Yeah, that's what we tend to see. 
is that people coming forward for treatment are are tend to be sort of middle aged uh, female. <clears throat> I don't think that necessarily means that there aren't a lot of male food addicts out there. I think they're not coming forward for, for treatment and they are more likely, they men are much more likely to come forward for alcohol treatment than women. And that doesn't mean that there aren't women struggling with an alcohol problem. I think there's partly a sort of cultural thing about who comes forward uh, for treatment. That's a really, really good point. And the, the groups were 11 to 40 participants. Yeah, so sort of, you know, a decent size that we could, uh, there could be discussion and, and support um, in the sessions. And what are, what are the results that you're seeing after this, after this process? Yeah, so, so super exciting. So we've published the before and after results. That's what the paper's based on. Uh, and yeah, significant improvements in, in food addiction symptoms on, on both scales that we used significant improvements in mental well-being which was really exciting to see and and significant weight loss and we've just <laughs> we're just looking at the one year follow-up data so that will be published soon enough and um we're actually ga we're gathering we we'd always intended to do two year follow-up which is you know more than most people ever do so we we will be looking obviously at the the two year data, if we can keep enough people in in the cohort, obviously some people get fed up of filling out your questionnaires so they uh, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, and those results will be premiered at the conference on 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 May the 17th. But we're very happy with them. Let's just say that. <laughs> Fantastic. That's that's really, really excellent. And you used sort of two different measurements a modified Yale food addiction scale and the ICD symptoms of food-related substance use disorder craved. Can you talk about those two different, why were they used and what, the, okay, what did they yeah. do? Yes. So the, the Yale Food Addiction Scale is the most widely known and used uh, scale in food addiction research. And in fact, there's probably hundreds of papers now looking at things like prevalence and some outcome uh, using the YFAS. And it was designed for research and it was designed um to mirror the criteria in the diagnostic and statistical manual of disease that the american psychiatric association host um for substance use disorders so the idea known as dsm dsm if other if 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 we're accepting this is um an addictive disorder does it look like other addictive disorders like 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 drug and alcohol so we took the they took the criteria Ashley Gerhardt took the criteria from the DSM for substance use and made a, a food use questionnaire <clears throat> so it's uh validated reliable widely widely used because it was designed for research it's not very friendly for using in a clinic and it's not a quick screen uh, it's quite difficult to score. I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, and it picks up some false positives um, because some of the items would be endorsed by somebody with an eating disorder. So you get some false uh, positive findings saying someone's got a food addiction, whereas actually there may be some overlap with with eating disorder problems. So, um, so there's been some some critique of it so because we're over here in europe and we use the icd over here which is hosted by the world health organization uh we wanted to use their criteria to make a questionnaire so they have six criteria for substance use disorder uh, and we also wanted to make it a super easy screen that people could understand and that people could use in clinic very quickly to screen you know it's not a diagnosis but it is a, a screen for potential problems and also you could use as a sort of repeat measure. And we wanted to, obviously we, we put both in the research so we could see how we could sort of, you know, cross compare and also see how each, how each performed um, and whether this, we could start thinking that this crave measure might be something we could recommend people would, would use in the clinic. So that's, uh, that's why we did it. And also at the conference, um, Professor Adrian Sotomota from Mexico has been using it in research um, and he was looking for us at how, exactly that, how it 
performs against the YFAS and whether it does this same thing as the YFAS of finding these false positives with eating disorders or it does it <laughs> does it what we're really hoping is that it correlates with the YFAS but it doesn't correlate with the eating disorder measure if you see what I mean so it would be a, a, a purer measure of food addiction symptoms so again that's going to be revealed at the at the conference that those findings and because we're we have two separate uh, releases of this interview can you quickly just two minutes just update people with the conference if they, they haven't listened to the other interview Mm, for sure. Yes. So very super exciting. Um, May the 17th in London at the Royal College of GPs, we've got a one day conference on um, on food addiction. But essentially it's to launch um, a piece of work that we've been working on all year. Heidi and I and some other colleagues. Um, it's a consent. We've been developing a consensus using a Delphi technique amongst clinicians and academics and other international experts on in the space of, of food addiction we've been developing a consensus on what to call it you know um what 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 research you know d already exists to sort of justify going forwards with this idea that it's a legitimate condition what further research do we need etc cetera, etc cetera. so um the consensus was framed around um five questions and um yeah so we're we're launching that consensus and the celebration is lots of lovely world experts coming to to talk to us um about about their research or you know their their views on on this topic so it, it should be a wonderful a wonderful event and yes. you can buy a live stream ticket or an actual ticket if you're in london and if you buy the live stream ticket you you will be able to just watch the videos at your own convenience at a later point you won't have to stay up all night and watch it if it no. doesn't suit your time zone that would be awkward and um because if we don't if you cannot arrive at consensus over what food addiction is it's very hard to incorporate that in government policy uh, that was the point really so we did make one submission to the who uh, a few years ago um, with a massive amount of research, I think we had 182 research papers or something like that, and uh, loads of people supporting the the submission. But the the um, committee came back and said, you know, it's a bit too controversial. There's no consensus, and they had to, a few other points. So we thought, well, our next practical step is to develop a consensus. So um, that's what we've done. Absolutely. That's fantastic. And and I'd like to sort of finish off today talking about your research um, work on hope and which we talked about a little bit in the other other interview. But I think this is a really if you hadn't a, if you weren't making hope a central focus of your your understanding and research, I, I'm not sure you, you could have supported your husband's clinic and gone into the work you've gone so effectively. Please, can you talk a bit about the role of hope in, in dealing with and moving away from food addiction? Mm, yes, absolutely. So, so hope's a very powerful predictor of how people cope with life and challenges, whether they're medical or whatever they are, really. So my, my doctorate was based on the, the um, looking at people who were having a lower limb amputation and what was it that predicted who did well and who didn't do so well? So who who adjusted sort of emotionally and, and physically to that challenge? And because it was a sort of the idea was it was kind of the same challenge for everybody. You know, they were all having a low, a lower limb amputated that we could look at, you know, was it age? Was it gender? Was it, you know, were there other factors that were, would predict who, who cope best with that challenge? And the best predictor by a country mile as they say was was hope and hopefulness um, and there's um there's a there's a lovely short again a short questionnaire hope questionnaire by a guy called Sch schneider i'm never quite sure how you pronounce it um and the idea is that hope is to do with having a sense of a preferred future but not just that having a sense that you've got the ability to take the steps to to get to that preferred future and thirdly 
you know, to know what the steps are, if you like. So it's being able to see the steps, having the confidence to take the steps and having this idea of where you're trying to get to. And that people who have that sort of approach to life, that everything, everything's sort of goal focused and I'm going to take some steps towards it, really tend to have this better level of health and, and happiness, even to the extent where they, they live longer. There's some lovely studies being done that I could talk about with nuns. <laughs> that have shown this this effect of, of, of hope on longevity um and i think it really works with conditions that are a chronic and b where people tend to feel pretty hopeless even generally hopeful people like me <laughs> who've tended to feel sort of pretty hopeless about their eating behavior at times um it can work quite well so the way that you, we can incorporate hope into treatment is to always start with thinking about the, the goals and the best hopes and where, where people want, want to get to. So what's a sugar-free life going to look like? What would be better about that? What would you be doing if you'd conquered this challenge? So really getting people into the space of thinking, you know, what, what would that what would that look like? And that's just that visioning of that starts to start the motivation <laughs> juices flowing if you like um and and then this idea of sort of knowing that you'll have the motivation to take those steps is thinking about you know what are a person's sort of particular strengths you know i'm quite an organized person how can i bring that to the challenge who's around supporting me um what have i achieved in the past i think people forget you know we've had i mean the last residential group that i ran for people with food addiction we had some inc i mean they were monstrously successful people they'd all had fantastic careers or were still having them you know family they were hugely successful people in every other walk of their life so we talk a lot about that and how did they do that and what is it about them and their strengths and their abilities so that they can i think we forget to apply that to this thing that we've got really hopeless about so bringing all that in and then all of positive psychology and behavior change shows that tiny small goals and incremental goals are much more effective than setting yourself some massive <laughs> sort of uh, massive change that you're you're much more successful if you make these small changes that then become habits and become embedded so um we get people to think about you know literally from the retreat we do right you're going to go home tomorrow morning what's the first thing that you're going to do when you walk in the door you know what what are you really going to focus on these sort of small behavioral changes and then those become part of this virtual cycle where they see that they can do that they see that it makes a positive difference so that makes them more confident they can make the next change and that leads on to more change and it becomes this sort of snowball of of positivity where they feel more hopeful and therefore they you know they are able to make more changes and sustain them so it's um yeah it's an ongoing process really this sort of um, and it's and it's interesting so sorry no i was just going to say the job of the practitioner really is is all of that is what are their best hopes what have they been successful in the past you know what is the small change that they're going to make what did they notice when they did that and just repeating that and being encouraging and and sticking with the process over time that's the job of the practitioner and the practitioner and then also the community group that you've seen fostered through the work with the the healthcare practice that's been powerful and people, you you said people stay once they once they start on the journey they stay and they coach other people yeah social support is massively important but i think once we've instilled that model in the group or in the individual they can they can do that for each other as well they can sort of Marble. model you know, well you know um you've had a little slip up well you know what would you do differently next time and you know what did you notice when you were on plan and what you know so they start using that kind of language um with each with each other which is is really nice and and it's interesting because it's personal responsibility in a different way it's personal responsibility to get off ultra processed food but these are addictive and that's my fault that I have addictive pathways in my brain. Yeah. So, so it's not, 
it's not your fault that you're an addict. Once you've got the information and the support, it's your responsibility to do something about it. Um, but it, it's it's not a <clears throat> it's not a self blame issue because exactly as a person with an alcohol problem, it's it's not their fault that they had the kind of brain that gets we all get exposed to alcohol. Just some of us develop that problematic relationship either because of genetic factors or early trauma or whatever it is. It's exactly the same with food. You know, some 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 of us as children <clears throat> learned that food was incredibly soothing and maybe we didn't have other ways, you know, other access. We don't have access to other drugs and uh, substances, but we do have access to, to sugar and it is a psychoactive substance. And in fact, Eric Clapton uh, said, we use a video of this in our, in our course, that Eric Clapton said that. He said, the guy said to him, oh, I think you started with cocaine or something. He said, no, I started with sugar because it was the only thing I had access to as a child. And uh, so where was I going with that? Yeah, so it's it's not our fault that we get hooked with just the kind of brain that we have. And um, we tend to have quite lively brains. The people that, that you know, with, with it, 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 they tend to be lively minded people. And that can that's um that's a blessing in many ways, <laughs> but slightly a curse in other ways. So um, that's just how we are. And we have to learn to manage that a bit like, you know, you and I's eyesight isn't perfect. So we, we just put some glasses on and, and off we okay. go. So we, yeah, it's a way of coping. We have to cope with this, this brain that, that we have. And uh, the best way of doing that is to feed it all the amino acids and the fatty acids that it needs. And unfortunately, modern dietary advice isn't the best brain health advice necessarily. Well, it isn't <laughs> necessarily. Not. And anyone interested in that, go ahead and read Georgia Ede's new book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. That um, is bad. Yeah, we need yeah, we need quality protein. We need quality fatty acids for body health and brain health. Yes, and then and then as well the 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 concept of the energy that you get when you change and um, that uh, Chris who wrote the Brain Energy book he's he's he talks about that, which yeah. which is fantastic. And then in New Zealand we have Julia Professor Julia Rucklich, she's a clinical psychologist, and and her book and, and it's interesting because Charles Snyder talked about how hope is a is a component of well-being and and helps us adjust to adversity. So Julia Rutledge in her research has found that that food helps with resilience. So so what you do is you know you use your sort of hope to get on the bandwagon and then the fact that you're improving your nutrition creates a feedback loop in your body which actually makes you more biologically able to to cope with the trauma or the the, the stuff of life. The now starting to trial um uh this way of eating to keto well ketogenic diets really even even more low carbohydrate if you like um protein and fat to help people with with other addictions like alcohol and drugs and there's quite a lot of evidence that yeah do, doing the nutrition right is going to help you with the the cravings and so on yeah and we all we all felt better david was a he was a lot more sort of Freddy before he he was like this and that I think that's partly why he's carried on working so long because he he just feels more able to cognitively fantastic honestly thank you Jen so much for your time today we've just it's been a great conversation and I've really appreciated yeah. this the insight that you can provide into food addiction and and the world of of healing thank you thank you